Seattle Seahawks are coming off of their first loss of the 2024 season. Monday night, primetime football in Detroit against the Lions. The Seahawks were missing essentially their entire defensive line, as well as some linebackers. Jared Goff ends up going 18 for 18. He has more receiving touchdowns in the game than he has incompletions. He actually set the NFL record for the most pass attempts in a game without an incompletion in NFL history. And Jared Goff now has more receiving touchdowns through week four than Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Sam Laporta, Brandon Ayuk, and Jalen Waddle combined with one. In the same light, Geno Smith and the Seahawks offense had a great night. He put up career numbers in pass attempts, pass completions, passing yards. A couple plays and penalties go their way and things look much different in this game. Under Ryan Grubb's new offensive schemes, Geno Smith leads the league currently in passing yards. DK Metcalf is third on the list in receiving yards. And Kenneth Walker, K-9, back to full health, scores three rushing touchdowns Monday night. And should the Hawks have gone for a two-point conversion at that point in the game? Let me know in the comments below. Will and I get into the recap of this game in Detroit, as well as previewing their upcoming matchup in Seattle against the Giants. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. If you are a current or former athlete, if you're just active and in the gym, you need to check out Black Label Supplements. They've got all types of supplementation, pre-workout, post-workout, aminos. My favorite is the sour watermelon creatine. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com. Use code COUCHGM to save you 15% off your order. And as always, if you are a sports fan in the Pacific Northwest thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing, reach out to myself, the Couch GM, Connor Webb. I'm a full-time mortgage broker during the day when I'm not making these sports videos. You can reach out. My contact information will be in the description of this video. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Hawks coming off a big matchup Monday night, prime time football against the Lions in Detroit didn't end up going their way we'll get into that uh recap but then also getting into the preview of the upcoming Giants game back in Seattle Will your overall thoughts of this this Detroit Lions game uh it kind of went what I thought right so uh this week when people ask me do you lean Lions do you lean the Seahawks I actually leaned to the over and then I was just kind of I don't know which team will win. And the reason I lean to the over is one, historically the last four matchups, they've been absolute barn burner shootouts, right? Then you factor in that the Seahawks, they're going to be without three of their four starting D linemen. That has all the recipes for Detroit being able to score. Seattle this year, they've shown that they can score. It's not like Detroit is known for having the strongest defense. They're known for having a defense that can get a couple turnovers here and there but largely they get one or two key stops and their offense wins them the football game. So I lean towards the over. When I look at the outcome, 42 to 29, I'm not entirely shocked. I feel like the score almost looks a little worse at times than what it really was. Like think about DK Metcalf getting mauled in the end zone. That very easily could have been thrown a flag. It probably should have been right. Defensive PI, you get the ball on the one, all of a sudden you score there you now have 36 to 42. You could also make an argument that DK should, he originally caught that ball in the two point try, right? They get the DPI, but you go back, you slow it down. You see DK has the catch. He has a foot in, in bounds. He has the shin in bounds. Now my question would be, cause I'm not a true rules expert, his knee, like part of his knee hits in and then part of his knee as he kind of rolls hits out. How does that work? I think it still should have gotten the review. Like at home, I'm all upset. Why isn't McDonald challenging it? Those two-point tries, they're actually supposed to be reviewed from New York. So that should have been an NFL review official calling down to the White Hat, hey, we need another look at this. And I think that they should have taken that look. I think it was a close enough play, whether you want to say, hey, his knee actually got out. So it doesn't count as a catch. He only got one foot in. Or if you want to say, yeah, he actually did. He got the shin in and he got the foot. So we're going to count it. It deserved to be looked at. But again, if you have that, all of a sudden it's a 30, it's a 42 to 38 game. The spread was four and a half. Now Seattle covers, right? So you look at this game and I feel like the score looks worse than what it really was. Now, I don't want to sit here and blame the officials, right? If you're a Seahawks fan, the defense has to play better, right? Jared Goff went perfect. He was 18 for 18. I say he's That's the first time in history, right? Or the most huh? attempts while being perfect? I don't know if it's the most attempts while being perfect. I know technically he doesn't qualify to become... Because he didn't get 20. Right. He has to get up to 20. Uh, but dude, 18 for 18, that's literally, it's literally perfect, right? And I would say 19 for 19 because he catches the pass out of the backfield. So, 
you got to play better in the secondary. Their zone looked bad. They were getting eaten alive in the zone game. It was just a bunch of crossers. Ben Johnson, the OC for Detroit, he called a perfect game. He wanted to have a bunch of crossers. He knew that he had the best O-line in football, and he's going up against, you know, one of the four starters Seattle usually has, so he doesn't need to add more people into protection. He can trust his five offensive linemen, six if you want to include the running back in that, to get the job done, and they did. Seattle really didn't have any pressure on the line. They had three sacks in that game. Those were the only three times they got any pressure on the Lions, right? So I feel like Ben Johnson and that crew came up with a game plan that they knew would work. And then the defense with Aaron Glenn and his crew, they knew they just needed to get one or two key stops, and they got those stops against the Seahawks. Yeah, essentially, you know, Seattle's entire defensive line, some of the linebackers were out of the game, so they weren't able to get the pressure to Jared Goff. As you mentioned, he went 18 for 18. 292 yards, two touchdowns. But yeah, like you've also mentioned, I feel like the Seahawks played better than I even expected. The score does look a little worse than the game probably showed, but DK Metcalf doesn't lose that fumble if they end up getting that two-point conversion. But let's get right into that, because why would you go for two in that instance? I mean, they were down 14 to 28. They get the touchdown. They could just go down one touchdown. I, I gen, genuinely don't understand why you'd go for two in that spot, especially with, you know, three Oh three left in the third quarter. Do you know? So it's, it's a math thing there, right? It's so the analytics you're... thing like baseball stack cast launch angle, yep. you know, exit velocity. Now it's like, okay, we're going to go for two every time. Right. Well, no, not every time, but <laughs> yeah. in that situation, when you're down 14, if you score a touchdown, the analytics say to go for two. So the idea behind this is basically most teams are about, 50% going for two, right? So the idea is if you have two or three plays that you're like, these are our two point plays, one of those two plays are going to get through and you're going to get the two points. In reality, you kind of did, right? DK coming back for the ball, you kind of did. Or if you didn't, you missed it by that much turf, right? You look like a genius if it works. Because <laughs> if it works and it works on the first one, well, now you're down six, you score a touchdown, you kick the field goal, you win. The thought process behind it is you're basically 50% from that mark. So if you miss the first one, if you get to the point where you score a touchdown, you do the second one, you'll get the uh, two-point conversion there if you're playing the numbers. I think it's actually a little over 50%. So I actually really like McDonald doing that. It was aggressive. It was him trying to get the team back into the game. If you get a big stop, which remember, Seattle got one stop in the second half, and it looked like, hey, you might be marching down and you can score and get the two-point conversion. It's a tie football game. So I didn't hate it. I liked it. it. It's going based on analytics. If you're going to do that, though, as McDonald, you better be aggressive that way all the time. Like, I will never crucify Dan Campbell for his aggressiveness. He went for a lot of fourth downs, remember, last year in the NFC Championship game against the 49ers he missed on all three of them or the two, right? So he goes for it twice on fourth down and he doesn't get either one. If he gets either one on fourth down, they win that ball game. And one of them literally hit his wide receiver in the chest and then they go to the Super Bowl, and then who knows, right? If you are going to be aggressive though, be aggressive always. If you are going to be conservative, like Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll was really conservative. He punted on the plus side of the field a lot because he trusted his defense. He'd get the ball back. They'd be in an easier position to score and they'd go down and score as opposed to giving his opponent the short side. Totally okay with that. Just be consistent. Where you see issues are like Brandon Staley when he was the head coach of the Chargers. Sometimes he'd go for it. Sometimes he'd be conservative. And then you don't get the benefit of either, right? If you're going to be aggressive and go with the analytics, you have to do it every time. So, so far, that's what McDonald's done. Totally okay with going for it there. I know a lot of people are going to want to blame the officials for this one, especially Seattle Seahawks fans. If you're blaming officials, you're not looking inward on yourself. The Tyler Lockett offensive PI call, that's bad. But I guarantee if you talk to Tyler, he's going to say, I could have done a better job of making it look more like I was going out for a route. DK, was he mauled in the end zone on what should have been a defensive pass interference call? A hundred percent. But if DK comes through and makes that catch, which we've seen him do it a couple times, 
then who cares, right? It's a moot point there. So while the officiating might have been bad, both teams had to deal with the officiating. And so I think it ends up becoming a null point. Detroit's going to look at some of the calls that they had go against them or didn't get called and say, well, that should have been a penalty as well, right? So it, it kind of evens out there, I think. And I believe it, I believe it was Carlton Davis that had like three holdings and pass interferences, and they pulled up a stat to where he had something like eight penalties in the first few games. Arnold. Arnold. So um, Arnold. the secondary. So Tyrion Arnold right now is leading the NFL in defensive pass interference and holdings, I believe. He had three in that game, and Davis had a couple others as oh, well. Tyrion Arnold. Okay. Yeah. I thought I saw uh, Carlton Davis with a few. I wonder, and I don't, I haven't done enough research into Detroit, but I wonder if it's a little bit similar to the Legion of Boom era defense where Richard Sherman and Maxwell and Browner kind of had this belief of we're going to hold on every single play in the secondary. We dare you to call it. And so officials might call it once or twice early, but then they get into their own head of like, well, I don't want it to be a ref show. Like, should I do it? Should I not? Remember, these refs are human too. So there are different weeks where there are points of emphasis, right? So right after the Tua hit, there's a lot of point of emphasis. And what a lot of the officials are being told is, hey, you need to protect the quarterback. You need to make sure that guys aren't headhunting. If they are, they need to be penalized for it. So they're looking for those headhunting penalties. They're looking for those roughing the passer penalties. And they're throwing more of them in the next week or so. Well, when they're doing that, their eyes are less on defensive pass interference, defensive holding, those types of penalties in that nature. It feels a little bit like the Lions are saying, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to hold on every play. We dare you to call it because you're not going to. The NFL will be upset and they'll tell you to not call the penalty. There's holding on every play, right? As an mm -hmm. offensive lineman, I'll tell you right now, there's never a single play that I held. But I'm only going to admit to the four or five that I got flagged for. No, I held five times this year. That's it. Because <laughs> I got flagged for it five times. I held every play, but you can only, you know, call me out for five of them. It's the same thing in the defensive secondary. And, I mean, I feel like you saw it in this game. You already had a flag for the defense jumping off sides, so they didn't call the defensive pass interference that happened on DK Metcalf. And you can whine and you complain and you can say, hey, that's not fair. These are the rules. It needs to be done by the letter of the law. That's just not how anything works. That's not how life works. If I get pulled over for going one mile over the speed limit, I should get a ticket by the letter of the law. I guarantee you if I come on here and I go, Connor, guess what? I just got ticketed. I went 51 in a 50. This is bogus. You're going to say, yeah, how dare that cop? Like it's, it's a waste of his time. You, know? you only sped one time, the one time you got caught. Uh, two or three times <laughs> i had a need for speed when i was younger <laughs> but you you get what i'm saying here there, yeah, yeah. there are these types of penalties all the time they're not going to call it every time you'd like them to call it in the big moments but it feels like in big moments they like to swallow their whistle that being said i thought geno smith had a fantastic game right now he's leading the nfl in passing yards he was five yards away from 400 he threw an interception guess what you were down by 15 in two minutes left. He had to throw towards the end zone. It's an incredible interception. That was Kenneth a career Walker, high in attempts, I believe, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, 56. How often yeah. do you see 56 passes right. in an NFL game? It never happens. Uh, Kenneth Walker, fantastic game. 12 carries, 80 yards, three touchdowns. He had a couple catches out of the backfield as well. He had maybe the most acrobatic broken tackle I've ever seen in the history of football. He did like three flips. I'm pretty sure he did a 619 in there. Like he took his Ray Mysterio mask and put it on before that play. It was unbelievable. And the other thing about Gino that we don't talk enough about or give him enough credit, I think, is his ability to move in the pocket right now with that offensive line. The guard play is really, really bad. They are getting destroyed at those two positions. And it's frustrating because you would have thought that Seattle had made the moves to improve that. They've spent multiple draft picks on guard play, and it just hasn't really turned out so far. Gino only got sacked three times, and he only lost 12 yards. And it felt like every single play, the pocket was collapsing on him and collapsing on him and collapsing on him. So I feel like that has to be said as well. His ability to move in the pocket but still keep his eyes downfield so that he can find Metcalf, lock it, uh, Smith and Jigba has been huge. And then, I mean, I don't need to say this. I think everyone in Seattle has known that DK is a number one wide receiver. 
But right now, uh, I believe he is top five. Yeah, he's third right now in receiving yards at 366 on the season. And remember, he started the season with 26 against Denver. So DK has really emerged, I feel like, as a top eight wide receiver in the NFL. And if he can continue to grow and grow in this system that Grubb is implementing on the offense, I think you might see a career year out of DK Metcalf. Absolutely. Yeah. The positive is that the offense looks solid. As you mentioned, Geno Smith, five yards away from 400 passing yards. Kenneth Walker is back and he looked phenomenal. He had three touchdowns on the ground, 12 carries for 80 yards, an average of 6.7. The receiving core has looked great. DK Metcalf, aside from that fumble, it's like, I mean, you got to give him credit for the effort, you know, maybe not not in that that spot. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to attack him for that. Like, look, man, you need to hold on to the football. You you have to hold on to the football, especially in that moment. He got hit right? on the back. I mean, it's like, you know. He broke three tackles. He ran he's, through he's three the biggest guy on the field, him. basically. He's like the, the right. fastest, the strongest guy that's going to be in the secondary. It's like he's thinking, I can win any of these battles right here. He's, mm-hmm. he's going for those yards. He's averaging 14.9 per catch in that right. game. I mean, he's a stud. I'm not going to jump on him. I'm, I'm, I'm not – and. Like, yes, you, you have to hold on to the football. And I feel like he has one or two of these every single year. But I'm not going to tell a guy who is bigger and faster and stronger than everyone that to, he needs to go down on the first hit so that he never has not Tyler Lockett. It's a little bit of a difference. <laughs> right. Like, how many times this year is he going to run over someone and it be the difference between getting a first down or not or getting a touchdown or not? And every once in a while, the bad play happens. It's like when you watch Patrick Mahomes. How many times have we seen him dance around, evade four or five rushers, be on the run, off-platform, 30-yard bomb, and Kansas City get a first down? Now, we've probably seen a couple different times every single year where he does that, and then he throws an absolutely horrific interception. Or he takes a 30-yard sack. But when he's able to do it well... There's more times he does it great than he times he does it terribly, terribly wrong. And I'm not going to be the one that tells him no more of doing it because you possibly could do something terribly, terribly wrong every third or fourth time you do this. Speaking of Patrick Mahomes, there's a uh, Chiefs fan in my fantasy chat. And uh, I told him that Geno Smith would not take out DK like Patrick Mahomes took out Rasheed Rice. (laughs) I mean, I... I know too soon, and I, you know, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but uh, just had to say it. Look, as a as a person who in fantasy drafted Xavier Worthy with their last pick, I I think it's a shame. I just I hate to see injuries. Um, just like I, the Rams I, being banged up, the 49ers, Christian McCaffrey out indefinitely, pretty much. Right. Um, what's going on in Arizona right now? It just it feels like they should have won against the Commanders. They either have a big play on a drive and they score a touchdown or they go three and out. It's just a shame to see teams in the division have to fight through injuries and then also have to fight through sputtering offense and an offense that isn't consistent. I just hate that. I want everyone to be playing at their best. <laughs> but we'll take it. Uh, yeah, Geno Smith is leading the league in passing yards with 1,182 passing yards through mm-hmm. four games. He... Like they were saying all broadcast, it was like, there's another fastball from Gino. Like he was fitting it into those windows. He was making great throws. Unbelievable. Gino looks great, to be honest. Yep, he does. Well, and look, um, you know, I was talking about this uh, on the radio show that I was doing this week. And uh, someone was saying, well, Gino and DK are really going extra hard right now because, you know, they're up for a contract. They want They want a contract within the next year or so. Awesome. <laughs> let's yeah, keep giving them It'll one year paid. contracts that's great <laughs> i've got no issue with that obviously you'd like to lock up dk for a little bit longer i think he's got till 2025 and then he, it's up it was a four-year deal originally so there's some time to work on that one obviously geno smith's contract is kind of set up so it can be basically every year they can get out of it if they want to and i understand why they set it up that way geno smith's what 34 he, you know, he's older. He's an older guy. And eventually in the NFL, Father Time wins. Father Time has never lost a battle. I have a coworker that says it this way. Father Time has never lost a battle. He's gone to a draw with two guys, Tom Brady and Barry Bonds. Everyone else, he's kicked their ass eventually. He's gotten them. Some people, it 
Father Time comes sooner. Some people, Father Time takes a while, but eventually he's going to get you. So right now, I get why the big Geno fans are saying, hey, see, look, we told you what he could be. We told you, we told you, we told you. And 100%, man, when you talk about the top eight quarterbacks in the NFL, if you just take this year, maybe even top five, Geno has to be in that list. But when you look for the future, there has to be a plan for what you do after Geno. And that's not going to change even if Geno Smith goes out and wins the MVP this year. Let's say Geno Smith has a career year under Ryan Grubb and he throws for 5,000 yards and he throws 11, 12 interceptions, but he throws for 40 touchdowns. Let's say that's the year that Geno has. MVP, Geno Smith. Yay! You got to have a backup plan because of how old he is. The Packers had a backup plan and it looks like it was going to, it's going to work out with Jordan Love. They had a backup plan for Brett Favre and look what it turned into. The Patriots did not have a backup plan for Tom Brady or they had a backup plan in Jimmy Garoppolo and Tom Brady got his ass out of it, but (laughs) they did not have a backup plan. And right now they're going to be on their second young quarterback in five years. Could Drake may turn out to be a great quarterback? Sure. But if he's not, you'll be on three in seven. Yeah. So got to have a backup plan. Uh, one more thing about the Seahawks. That that play where I believe it was Jackson Smith and Jigba caught the pass and then he threw it back to Charbonnet and they took that from the Lions playbook. Is that <laughs> is that accurate? That was pretty sick. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what. Um, I love that Ryan Grubb is – so willing to work with his players like right now it feels like when you look at the best teams in the nfl kansas city detroit hopefully seattle's moving into that vein i mean even buffalo to a degree what are they known for they're known for going to their players and saying hey what's what's a fun play that we can find i mean kansas city has dudes doing duck duck goose you know before plays (laughs) Uh, the Lions in this game, Amon Ross St. Brown caught a touchdown and threw for a touchdown. They had two players literally catch and throw for a touchdown today. Amon Ra just moved up to 48th on the list in the league in passing yards with six, <laughs> seven passing yards. With seven. <laughs> Amon Ra St. Brown caught and threw a touchdown pass, and Jared Goff caught and threw a touchdown pass. And it feels like the Seahawks are doing that as well. The other thing that I want to point people out to. If you want to just laugh, look at the route trees that the Seahawks were running and the routes that DK, JSN, Tyler Lockett ran when Shane Waldron was here versus what they run now with Ryan Grubb. And then look at DJ Moore's routes that he ran in Chicago last year and then this year with Shane Waldron. Hmm. Shane Waldron had him running like four routes. Ryan Grubb has him running all over the field. Shane Waldron, you only use the outside edges. You never use the middle of the field. And if you did, it's because you were running a seam route, which is basically running a vertical right up the middle. You do it because the team is in too high safety. You try and split the two safeties. Do you have a link to a tweet like showing a graphic of that? uh, I could go look for one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the PFF guys put it out or uh, Mina Kimes. Mina Kimes has all kinds of Seahawks stuff. She's fantastic Twitter follow if you haven't. But look at the route trees that they were running before and what they're running now. And you can see why the offense looks so much improved and why a lot of these wide receivers, maybe not Tyler Lockett, but that's just because he's getting older. But JSN specifically and DK specifically, why they are already looking at, well, maybe they're going to have a historic year. Yeah, it's it's really exciting to see this this new look offense this year. Things are progressing in the right way. Uh, the defensive line will hopefully be back to full health and we'll be able to see the full strength of the team. This is a tough matchup, their first true matchup of, of the year, their first challenge. But credit to where credit is due, Jared Goff, he had a great night. Jameer Gibbs, 14 carries, 78 yards, averaging 5.6. David Montgomery looked like he could do whatever he wanted to at times. He, he looked solid. Uh, you know, the wide receivers had a great game. But moving on to next week, looks to be a, a very winnable game in Seattle against the New York Giants coming into town. What, what do you see in this matchup? Currently, Seahawks are predicted to have a 65.3% chance of winning winning this one. The over-under is 41.5. Seahawks are favored by five and a half. 
Uh, yeah. So right now with this one, if you're going to win this Seattle, uh, I'd like to hope that one of Mafe Williams and Murphy come back. I really hope that you get two. It sounded like McDonald and his staff wanted to be precautionary because you did have to play three games in 11 days. And so their kind of view on it was, well, maybe, you know, we let these guys rest this week. If they need to rest again on the short week against the giants, we let them rest because you have a, sh- a third short week in a row, which is just poor scheduling. You know, you get two, you get one long week, I guess, technically, but then you get back to back short weeks with a Monday night to Sunday night. And then you get a Sunday night to a Thursday night, but that Thursday night game, you're playing the 49ers. So hopefully you get at least one of those guys back between Mape Williams and Murphy. Um, I think that greatly improves that defensive line. Like Derek Hall was still able to get a sack. Obviously he got the safety and that's huge. Derek Hall has been fantastic in the new McDonald system, but you can tell that they're not as deep as you might like at that defensive line. If you could get Nuosu back for the first time this year, that would also be a huge get. So one of those four, if you can get at least one good, if you can get two out of the four, great. Um, I think that's going to add a lot of pressure to Daniel Jones. Their offensive line for the Giants, they're not very good. And Daniel Jones isn't very good, frankly. And he's one of the more, uh, one of the true sayings about quarterbacks is if you can get pressure on them, pressure in their face, they're going to struggle. The great ones don't. That's why they're great. That's, you know, Tom Brady is Tom Brady because when people brought pressure, he stood in the pocket, was fine. It didn't scare him. It scares Daniel Jones. So you need to be able to get after him. Right now, there's one player on that offense that scares me. It's Malik Neighbors. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think if the rookie of the year, if it ended right now, if he's not number one, he's number two. Like, I get it. Marvin Harrison has, what, three or four touchdowns? But Malik Neighbors has been everything for the Giants. And then Jaden Daniels, I mean, what he's doing in Washington – It's not just unheralded for a rookie. Like no one's ever completed passes the way that he's been completing passes. And he's doing it not just by being a check down Charlie. So Malik neighbors is going to be what you have to stop. Bright side, you have Tyreek Warren and you've got Witherspoon. And I feel like if you have those two rotate in coverage, you are going to be able to stop him where you saw them struggle against Detroit was they couldn't go a whole lot of man coverage because they didn't trust that the D line was be going to be able to provide the pressure. So they were bringing a lot of zone blitzes or they were just going straight zone. Jared Goff, that dude is cerebral. He's going to pick apart a zone. And Ben Johnson came up with a great game plan. I don't know that Brian Dable is going to be able to come up with that same game plan more. So I don't know that Daniel Jones is going to be able to execute that same game plan against Seattle. So I'd like to see Tyreek Woolen and Witherspoon in coverage over neighbors as much as possible. If you can bracket cover him where you've got one underneath, one over the top, making it really hard to fit the ball into certain windows. I like what Seattle can do against this team. I'm not really that scared of their defense. Continue to feed Kenneth Walker. Uh, He looked like he hadn't missed a beat. I mean, 12 carries, 80 yards, three touchdowns. He's now got what? four on the year, five, something like that, four. I've got it up here. So continue to feed Kenneth Walker. That's going to open up your pass game. DK has been fantastic. JSN has been great. Tyler Lockett is Tyler Lockett. You can always count on that guy. And then frankly, the tight end play uh, between the kid out of Michigan and Noah. Yeah, he looked great. They've been awesome. And they're big bodies, dude. You big finally dude. have two big bodies and it feels like Seattle knows how to utilize them. It's not like a Jimmy Graham situation where you have this big body and it's almost like he's more for show than anything else. Like, I like what this passing game is doing. I like what this offense is doing. It really is all going to come down to, can you shut down Malik Neighbors, who, by the way, has 20 more yards than DK Metcalf. Yeah, Malik Neighbors is currently second in the league in receiving yards, 386 yards through four games. He's averaging 11 uh, a catch. Yeah, he's really the guy for them. The next, you know, closest wide receiver is Juan Dale Robinson at 39th on the list. So if they could stop, if they could stop neighbors, I, I unfortunately went against neighbors this week at fantasy, ended up losing that matchup for for reasons, uh-huh. obviously Malik. For but reasons. um the the Seahawks are currently graded by PFF as fourth overall as a team. The Giants are currently 23rd overall. 
Yep. The Giants are one and three again coming into Seattle. And if this is a week to where you need to rest some of those defensive linemen to get them back to being healthy, some of those linebackers, then this is a week to where you could let your offense go do their thing. Defense just needs to man up on one guy really um, and, and can get the job done. Right. Well, and he is, he is coming off, you know, that concussion that he suffered in the fourth quarter against Dallas. So there's a chance that he doesn't play. You get 10 days off. If it was, Hey, he gets, he got hurt on Sunday. I'd probably bet that he's not going to play with concussions in the NFL and no concussion is the same. There's a certain protocol that you have to go through that you have to pass 10 days puts him kind of right at that mark where I could see it going either way. Like there's a reason he's questionable and not doubtful listed for this game. Um, so it'll it'll be interesting to see what happens on his playing ability. But I'd tell you right now, if I'm Seattle, bracket cover that dude and then hope that Hall and if you get Mafe back, great. If it's Nuosu, fantastic. If it's neither one of those guys, uh, you know, Hopefully some of your guys that are coming up that are getting more time can get after the passer. Cause if you can get in Daniel Jones grill, he will turn the ball over. This isn't a very good offense. And the more that their defense is left on the field, trying to stop your offense, the better you can run away with this game and then hopefully get some rest for your key players before you go and play San Francisco. Now, all that being said, do not overlook the giants because I know the Las Vegas Raiders did that. And the Red Rifle, also known as Andy Dalton, came in and he won a football game against a team that really thought that they were going to be 2-1 and one on the season. And now at this point, you're 2-2. Two and two. So if you're Seattle, you cannot lose this one. You are at home. You need to take care of business. It needs to look a certain way. Go into the, your game against San Francisco at 4-1. and one. That's a big deal, especially in that division. Keep that lead that you have in that division. It's going to be a, a tough schedule after the Giants. So this is a crucial game to go four and one instead of three and two. You got the 49ers at home on a short week after that. It's going to be a Thursday night game against uh, the 49ers. Then you got out at Falcons versus the Bills versus the Rams, who should have at least one of those wide receivers back. And then right. at 49ers against the Cardinals, you know, the schedule just gets tougher from here. So these are the crucial games right here. Right. You go on a run where uh, you play a lot of really good teams. Obviously, San Francisco is good. Atlanta seems to be figuring it out. Kirk Cousins is knocking the rust off. Buffalo, I know they just lost to Baltimore. They might be the best team in the NFL right now. If they're not, they're what? They're definitely putting up the most Third, points or have the best spread. Let me look it up. Right. Like, they're, they're a really good team right now. And you would have thought they would have taken a step back, and they really haven't. L.A., Sean McVay. He's a genius. He finds ways to win games that he shouldn't necessarily win. They beat a 49er team that they shouldn't have won, right? Everyone was out. There's no reason to win that game, yet they found a way to do it. Then you get the bye week, which is nice because you get the bye going into San Francisco. That's a big, big deal. But you're going to play Arizona. They're frisky. The Jets are still to come. I think they've largely been a disappointment. I think they've been kind of more of what I thought they were going to be, which was uh, less than a double-digit win team. They're still going to be frisky. You get Arizona. Green Bay's looked really good this year. Minnesota, a team that I thought that you would dominate, run through. You can make the argument that they're the best team in the NFL right now. They're tied Chicago. for the best differential in the league with the Saints. Right. Chicago, they're going to be frisky, man. Caleb Williams, I get it, man. He has moments where he doesn't look good. That offensive line is really bad. But he also has moments of, wait, he just threw for 300 yards in this game? Wait. Romo Dunze was in double coverage and he fit that into that spot. How did he do that? And then you get the Rams again at the very end. So look, I know I just kind of francesca it when I went through win, loss, win, loss, you know, as I go through the schedule. But what I'm telling you right now, Seattle, is there aren't many guaranteed winners on this schedule. And it feels like the Giants game is one. You cannot lose it, especially this early especially this early just look yeah. at the mariners if they take care of business against the royals uh, too soon too soon sorry too soon. I you know what <laughs> I apologize. No, I'm no, you're kidding. <laughs> gotta win more than 54 percent in the nfl just saying if they would have won 54 percent, they would have been in the playoffs just saying if they won that one game against kansas city when they were up eight to zero. Oh, yeah that's all the talk yeah 
<laughs> and the ownership has come out saying that they're not going to go after the top free agents. That will be a separate video. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we're in a spot with the Mariners. <laughs> um, as we kind of wrap it up, I mean, I was looking at these stats. This is kind of surprising. So the most points scored in the NFL, the New Orleans Saints, the 127. Yeah. The Bills have 122, so they're close behind. The largest differentials in the league are the Vikings and the Saints tied at plus 57. So Sam Darnold's getting the job done with the Vikings. The Saints are surprising right. people. Um, the Bills are obviously right there as a powerhouse. So it's going to be a, an, ex an exciting season. Hopefully they can get the, the win this week against the Giants. Make sure to tune in to the recap once that comes out next week. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you again, Will, for joining us. Make sure to go follow Will on social media. Follow In the Trenches on YouTube as well for more football content. And we'll see you after this one.